It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Pride. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Welcome to Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. Thanks so much for being with us. Madeline Burke and Lance Meadow here with you today at Madeline Burke, at Lance Meadow, M-E-D-O-W, on social media. The phone number here is 201-939-4513, or you can find us on Twitter at hashtag Giants Chat. And as a reminder, you can find the archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and Giants.com slash podcast. The first show of the after season, I guess, off season. That's one for, way to put it. Sure. The Giants right here on a Monday morning. Uh, the Giants finished strong, got the win over Philadelphia last night, which I'm sure everyone is well aware. 27 to 10 to finish off the season. 6 and 11 record. Uh, finishing third in the NFC East, picking number six overall in the first round of the 2024 NFL Draft. Uh, but of course, Lance, we got to start the show with the news of the day. You know, Coach Brian Dable and, and GM Joe Shane spoke to the media. They acknowledged that after the season, they uh, did relieve uh, special teams coordinator Thomas McGahee and offensive line coach Bobby Johnson of their duty. So those are some staff changes. Dable said that he does expect that Wink and Kafka will be back with this coaching staff and, you know, looks forward to that uh, in the future. But as we look for, you know, turning the page now from the 2023 season, Lance, what are your thoughts? Well, as you hit on it, I think obviously the biggest takeaway from the pressers today was the coaching changes. What I'll add to that is not that this was stunning news because there were reports previously. They also need a new running backs coach, mm-hmm. Jeff Nixon, moving on to become Syracuse's offensive coordinator and running back coach. And Craig Fitzgerald, who was the strength and conditioning coach, yep. has taken a similar position at Florida as the director of football operations. So there's various different openings right now across the board on this staff, but the most notable one is obviously in the trenches on the offensive line. It's an area that Madeline has defined this franchise really for the last decade, and it's not the lack of addressing personnel. They've brought in many players through free agency and the draft. Now it's a matter of continuing to develop these options and gaining that cohesiveness. To me, you want to tell the story of the 2023 campaign. There's a lot of statistics I could throw your way, but injuries on the line specifically is probably right atop the list. Ten different offensive line combinations in 17 games. And they had the 10th one Sunday because you had Matt Parrott inserted, obviously, at the tackle spot. John Michael Schmitz was out. So Ben Bredesen moved over to center. Glowinski to right guard. And... Here we go again. It was almost basically bookends to the season, right? right? In terms of the injuries started immediately in week one, and they ended the same way in week number 18. And you know what's wild, too, is watching it in real time, when you say 10 different combinations, that feels low. Like, that feels low, considering Uh. how week in and week out and watching it in real time, the amount of changes and turnover on that line. I mean, you know, we we got a chance to go into the locker room and talk to a lot of the players today as they were cleaning out their lockers. You know, baggy day or boxing day, because of course they're using boxes now. Well, they're using Um, a combination. Some bags, some Some boxes, you know, to each their own. To each their own, but, you know. We won't judge. We will not be judgmental. Not judgmental. I don't know. It sounded like you were being a big judgmental. Yeah. It was, oh, more, sure? it was more just painting a full and clear picture okay. of, you know, we, baggy you. day feels like false advertisement. Um, but, you know, I talked to Andrew Thomas. I talked to John Michael Schmitz. And one of the things that, you know, both of them really emphasize is just the offensive line. You know this, Lance. It's like this is the only group as a unit that needs to play as one. They need to play as one single entity as opposed to just okay a collaboration of individuals that are doing this they need to play as one and having that much change that much turnover of course there's going to be some issues and and you know that leads to a season in which the Giants allowed the second most sacks in in NFL history yep. on a season 85 and so that is not a stat that's not a, a, an accomplishment that you want to be in the top five of of course uh, but that's where it ended up with this season and you know Andrew Thomas says hey you know what looking at that that's not something that next season feels like a carryover. But as an individual, he said, I want to take it as a point of pride, too, that I need to be a better leader. I need to stand up as, you know, the left tackle of this group, as a leader in this unit. 
I need to do better at, at the accountability for this unit, for my teammates. Well, the other thing that I thought was interesting that he pointed out, he was asked about what are you looking for in a new offensive line coach, right? Because right. every offensive line coach has a personality. You're looking for a motivator or you're looking for a guy that focuses on fundamentals. And one of the things that I took away from Andrew Thomas meeting with the media was he said probably the most important element, not necessarily just with the offensive line coach, but the five guys that you were talking about being on the same page is everybody being fundamentally sound. Right. He actually, he said that's more important than the continuity of the five guys playing all 17 games. The fact that everybody does their job effectively. And yes, it sounds like a cliched line I took out of Bill Belichick's playbook out of New England, do your job. But I think there's a lot of validity behind that, that if one guy has a mix up from a fundamental standpoint, especially if it's handling a stunt or a twist, which the Giants had some troubles with this season. Madeline, it doesn't matter whether Andrew Thomas is perfectly polished on his side of the thing. You have one breakdown, it's over. Mm -hmm. So the emphasis this offseason into next season is going to be everybody having to be fundamentally sound. And fundamentally sound on the same page because you have to have your fundamentals sound, but you also have to perceive things the same way. You have to to understand. You have to see the field the same way. You have to perceive the defense the same way. You have to perceive it and and be on the same page. And so, you know... One guy could look at something and another guy could look at something and see something completely different. And that's where the disconnect could come. You need to make sure that everyone is understanding and 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 perceiving it the same way to have those fundamentals aligned. Right. Well, and that's why I think when they look and pursue a new offensive line coach, they're going to take all of that into consideration. And I'm sure one of the most important questions that Brian Dable is going to ask any of the candidates is give me your takeaway of the state of this offensive line right now. I mean, it doesn't hurt. Even Madeline, if you don't hire the individual Mm -hmm. as the offensive line coach, if I'm Brian Dable, I want to be a sponge. If I'm Joe Shane, I want to get as much outside input as humanly possible. What does the outside world think of the personnel? Because whether you hire the individual or not, everybody's going to bring a perspective to the table. And here's the other thing. Brian Dable's been around the NFL for decades, okay? Not years, decades. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you he has crossed paths with tons of other well-established candidates. They'll do their due diligence, and they'll try to bring in an individual that is a good fit for what they want to run from an offensive standpoint, especially with he and Kafka still in the picture. But also, the emphasis has to be on, and this is not a shot at Bobby Johnson. Let me make this very clear. But the development of young players, okay? Because if this line is going to take the next step forward, a lot of the players, and Joe Shane talked about this in the press conference, specifically the ones who were brought in through the draft over the last few years but have not been able to stay healthy, Mm -hmm. can you still find ways to develop them? Specifically, Josh Azudu and Marcus McKeith. And I think those two guys are the top of the list. Joe Shane, if I'm correctly quoting him, he said it's critical third years for both of those guys. Right. Okay. Can they stay healthy? Can they stay on the field? Zudu, unfortunately, and we talked about this when he came out of UNC, versatile player. Right. Exposure across the line. Just but if you can't injury. stay on the field, you can't tap in to that potential. And that's what the goal is going to be for that new offensive line coach. Develop and add more quality and depth so that in the event, Madeline, you go through the game of musical chairs again, right. it's not baptism by fire with a lot of these players. Right, and that's a tough role to have, too, with a lot of a lot of respect to Bobby Johnson. He's a great guy, great person to be around. I, I, I loved working with him. Uh, but when you look at the fact that the amount of injuries that this group had, you know, you mentioned Azuto, I mean, all these guys, you got Justin Pugh coming straight off the couch a, oh, yeah, as a, a guard. Lot of change. And, and yeah. even having to play a little bit of tackle because of the amount of injuries. I mean, the fact Andrew Thomas laughed about that. He's like, you got Pugh going over to tackle for a little bit. These guys were doing what they could to, to plug the holes, but it was like a boat that was leaking. You're just trying to shovel it out as opposed to just being able to stay above the water. So that will be a challenge for whomever the coach is, whomever the coach was this season and would have had that challenge as well. Um, and, you know, wishing all these coaches continued success as their careers continue in, in this league or elsewhere. Well, listen, the sad part of this industry is there's a reason why it's called Black Monday right. in the NFL, Madeline. It's because, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that lose their jobs. And Brian Dable started off his press conference today, and he didn't want to go into detail as to why he moved on from specifically Bobby Johnson and Thomas McGahee. But first thing he did was he thanked them. And you have to understand, him and Bobby Johnson go way back. Right, Okay, They were together in Buffalo. 
Bobby Johnson was the offensive line coach. Dable was the offensive coordinator. They were together for three seasons. Then he brings him over Mm -hmm. as he starts his first tenure as a head man here with the Giants. He was here for the last two seasons. Thomas McGahey, okay? And McGahey probably pulled off what most coordinators would wish they could do. He lasted with four different head coaches yeah. in this organization. A decade okay. here with the New York Giants. Ten yes. seasons, but the four head coaches, Madeline, that's, is, huge... that's the key statistic. Exactly. Tom Coughlin, his first in 2007 to 2010. Now, in fairness, he was the assistant special teams coordinator. He leaves. He comes back. Pat Shermer, 2018, yep. two years. Joe Judge, two years. Mm-hmm. And Brian Dable, two years. With the movement and turnover rate in the NFL, normally when a new coach comes in, he says, I'm bringing in my own guys. Right. So I think it says a lot about Thomas McGahey, how well-respected he is. And if you look at how the special teams unit performed earlier in his tenure, okay, they were making inroads, unfortunately, the last two years. And here it goes back to what we were talking about, the offensive line. McGahey was trying to keep the pieces together with a lot of injuries, a lot of movable parts. I loved his line. He always talked about the gumbo. Yeah. Making the gumbo, right? You and I have talked about this on the show. Exactly. Or it's like, yeah, it's like making whatever's in the cupboard, throw it in the gumbo. Yeah. You know, if it's shrimp, if it's chicken, you name it, just whatever can keep the meal afloat. Yeah. He was asked to do a lot of that because of the injuries, because special teams coordinators, they're at the mercy of the other needs of the roster, right? Yeah. The offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator says, Nick McLeod, you're going to be called up. Because Deontay Banks is hurt. Okay, so Thomas McGahey now has to come to the realization, I can't use Nick McLeod on special teams. I'm just using an example, a hypothetical here. And now he has to get another guy ready. I mean, they deal with constant change more so than anybody else in any position on an NFL coaching staff. Right. That's why those special teams meetings are so packed because everyone's got to be ready for their All hands on deck. All hands on deck. Exactly. Exactly. Giants fans, make sure you go and subscribe to the Giants Huddle podcast. It features long form interviews with Giants players, coaches, and front office staff past and present. Plus, hear from the best analysts covering Big Blue and the NFL. Search for Giants Huddle and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or simply go to Giants.com slash podcast. And don't forget, if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star positive review for all of our Giants podcasts. Now, Lance, I know you and I have a lot to say about this season, this team, but we get a lot of airtime. So let's send it over to the phones right now because I know we've got some fans who have been patiently waiting, calling in. Phone lines are lighting up 201-939-4513. As we head to line one, Jay in Phoenix has been holding the longest Jay, what's going on? You're on Big Blue Kickoff Live with Lance and Madeline. Hey, guys. Um, thanks for having me on. And, uh, yeah, it's, when you look at the season, I think I'm glad it's over. Um, it, uh, it started off horrendous. It seemed to get worse. But the thing that I was most concerned about is, is Brian Dable going to be able to keep this team together? Do they have the right players who are going to fight till the end? And I think they proved that. You know, as you look – I think maybe around the midpoint of the season, um, they rallied and they did not quit. And yesterday's game, two, I don't care about draft slots or anything like that, but to beat the Eagles the way they did. And I'm not talking about the second half of the game. I'm talking about the first half. Yeah. When the Eagles had a chance, they beat them, and it was beautiful. Mm-hmm. It was beautiful. <laughs> I mean, fair uh, point, was, Jay. I mean, we've all seen those seasons where the Giants struggled to get 20 points offensively in a game and putting up 24 to nothing in the first half. That was the, that must have been a great thing to see. Well, an old 27 oh, was, was actually a product of the offense yesterday. Exactly. See, there were several games this season they've gotten over the 20-point hump, but you had a pick six with a Dory, for example, in the first Eagles matchup. Pin or you had Miami, some other yeah. opportunistic plays. The offense was responsible for putting all 27 on the field, and they had four takeaways. They didn't score any points off of those four takeaways. That's right. more than a reason to compliment the offense because they did a lot of the heavy lifting Absolutely. The other day. And Jay, I like where your head's at. It's like, listen, we, we don't mind wherever we draft they'll figure it out but let's just get those wins because that's that's what you'd play the game for right well in the in the they're big gonna get p- a yeah, good, go they're gonna, oh, i was gonna say they're gonna get a great player at six yeah. so we're gonna be fine um the other thing i wanted to just touch base on and it was it was a small moment in the game but listening to carl banks on his show with bob papa the other day and talking about what he would do with that stupid tush push play <laughs> and how he would jump over the line i I love Bobby Okereke. I can't. It's a little can't too talk soon, about Bobby. How much we enjoyed. We enjoyed watch. I just enjoyed watching him play this year. And even when he was on the Colts last year, that game against the Giants, I liked the nastiness. Even though he was going after my quarterback. And when they signed him, I was like, "Oh, this is. I love it. He's great. And he's been great 
he reminds me, you know, I, I started watching um, Giants football probably about 83, 84. And so I grew up with LT, Pepper Johnson, Harry Carson, Carl Banks, and Bobby O would just fit right in with those guys. I mean, he, he's he got the right nastiness, impact play, competent, just really excited to have him on the team and looking forward to next year even being better. Absolutely. So, yeah. Anyways, that's all I had to share. So you guys have a great day, and uh, thanks for all your hard work this season. Thanks for all the right. call, Jay. Appreciate well. it. And, Jay, I, I will say, too, I'll add to that, I think Carl would agree with you. Carl, I think from the start – um, you know, reached out, developed a relationship with Bobby Okereke. Those two text on a regular basis. They've got a really good relationship. Uh, Carl even used Bobby in his starter campaign this year as well, and I think he sees a lot of himself and, and that vintage Giants linebacker core in Bobby Okereke. Well, he's an old-school linebacker. He's a yeah. great playmaker. He's got good instincts. You see the fact that he played every single defensive snap, so you certainly don't question his toughness. And kudos to him and Xavier McKinney because we talked about all the injuries on this team. You got two guys at the same time that suited up for every single game, every single snap. And Brian Dable gave both of them game balls yesterday. Well-deserved. But, you know, you need guys like that to help set the tone. And it just goes to show you there's value in that linebacker position in today's NFL. I think a lot of people have conversations about – well, you don't play three linebackers anymore, right? Because you're going to use the extra defensive back, three wide receiver sets. Well, Bobby Okereke has proven if you can prove as a linebacker, you can stay on the field mm -hmm. for all three downs. You can be active. You got good instincts. You can make opportunistic plays. There is room for you on the roster. And not only is there room for you on the roster, there's room for you to play, carve out a role, and make a significant impact. So yeah. that is by far the home run of this offseason. Whether you take the draft or free agency into consideration, when you tell the story of the 2023 offseason before mm -hmm. this year, Bobby Okereke was a slam dunk addition to this team. A slam dunk addition indeed because he was named a captain in his first season here. You know, signed as free yeah. agency, immediately making an impact so much so that he's named a captain before, you know, before this season. Uh, you know, we talk about a lot about the key to the Giants' success was the defense, the pressure, the takeaways, winning the turnover battle. But it, it's easy to forget that in the beginning of the season, Giants struggled in, in both sacks and turnovers, right? It took them about sure. five weeks to get well, a takeaway. Well, they had no takeaways in the first four. Exactly. Yeah. It took them about five weeks to get a takeaway. And Bobby Okereke was one of those veteran presence players that kind of continue to pound the point saying, hey, we got to stay patient, but this is a point of emphasis. Here's how we work on it. Here's how we work towards that. I mean, I talked to him about that a little bit in the locker room today, too. And it's just, you know, it's hard when that's something that you know is so pivotal, taking that many weeks, four weeks without a takeaway, finally getting it and being like, OK, now here we are. And that becoming a strength of that defense later on in the season just shows the fact that they were able to kind of stay persistent and patient through that. Well, Okereke, based on what you just hit on, he spells out also the value of having play callers hang around. Because yes. it also, and Okereke would be the first one to admit this, it took him a few weeks to get comfortable in the defense. There's a reason why he started to click around the time period of week five, week six. Because mm -hmm. he needed the first quarter of the season, Madeline, to understand, A, what Wink wanted him to do, and get a feel for his teammates. Yep. Okay, so... When we say you don't change coordinators for the sake of changing coordinators, even though maybe it wasn't smooth sailing, is because if we go down a hypothetical road, and I'm not saying this is going to happen because Dable clearly said he wants both of them back. The expectation is they will return. You now ask Okereke to learn yeah. another defense on top of getting used to new teammates because the roster is going to change no matter what you do. That's life in the NFL. Why would you want to put a player in that position who already is starting to thrive and getting a real good feel for what he can do within the confines of this defense. That's well, just impractical. And not just Bobby Okereke, but the way that Dexter Lawrence has really grown and yeah. flourished under Wink Martindale. And also, you know, Dex was giving a lot of credit to Dre, too, the defensive line coach, the fact that, like, the amount of growth he's had in his game the last few years, uh, second Pro Bowl in a year in a row for Dex. Um, and, you know, another point that Jay made, too, at the beginning of his call is, is how this team rallied and didn't quit. And I think that's something that we have observed all year in this locker room, whether it's, you know, the beginning of the season when they're really struggling and, and having some some tough goes or they're on the winning streak, a three game winning streak or ups and downs. The locker room really felt even keel and and stuck together and rallied together and the fact that they played competitively these last few weeks after being eliminated from postseason contention they're they're in it against the rams they beat the eagles they ran through the tape and that's really a testament to it and joe shane pointed that out at this 
press conference earlier today, that's a testament too to Brian Dable and the coaching job that he's done and the ability that he's had to say, hey, we're going to keep this team, this unit focused. Yes, there's highs and lows. I mean, you, you have success last season and that's one thing, but you really get to know who a person is as a coach, as a player, as what have you, when you're going through adversity. And the fact that this team went through that adversity and stuck together and competed through the end of the season says a lot. And I think it's a reflection of the rest of the staff as well, the position coaches keeping those guys engaged. But I think there's a few factors as to why you saw that happen. Number one, there's a relatively young roster. And I've said this time and time again, young players don't know any better. All they know is to go out and compete. You know, they haven't been in the league for 10 years. So, you know, they can't afford to adopt the mindset of, well, I'll just go through the motions. It's week 17, 18. I'm mathematically eliminated because they're not guaranteed to be back on the roster. The second thing is, and I've been saying this till I'm blue in the face, I'll continue to emphasize it, Madeline. Players don't care about draft picks. They don't care. Yeah. Okay. No, but there's some fans that have the mentality (laughs) that they're, of the mindset, no, oh, well, no you know, player, we get yeah. a linebacker at five versus six. So, no you know, let me help the team No player is going to mail it in. No player is going to no. mail it in with the thought of, oh, yeah, let me just play poorly so we get a better draft pick to potentially draft my replacement. No. No, or, these players are on the field. They can play, You play to win the game, to co- quote Herm Edwards. Sure, or be not even around to see that draft pick. Exactly. There's a lot of guys on one-year contracts that are not even guaranteed to be wearing Giants uniforms next season. So those are the two things that jump out to me as as to why I'm not surprised with how hard this team played because you combine youth with a bit of being naive, for the lack of a better phrase, because you don't know any better. And then on top of the fact that players just don't care about draft picks, they care about putting good film out there to secure their job either here or elsewhere in the NFL. Right. Well, and that's the mature approach. And I think the youth could be a double edged sword, too, because youth means, you know, you're coming into this league. If you're making it in the NFL, you're usually playing on a team in college that's had some success, right? I mean, a college team that has success means undefeated or maybe one loss on a season. That's almost damning. So to go from that to having the struggles in an NFL season is a big culture shock almost for a young player. It's like, okay, wow, in college you're used to you lose once, you're out of it for, you know, for good. Whereas in the NFL, you got to kind of weather the storm a little bit. And so the fact that these young players were able to navigate that as well shows the maturity of, you know, the players that this organization has drafted and the culture that is being created in this Giants locker room. Well, when you think about it, guys like Andrew Thomas and Xavier McKinney, and they've been here for several seasons, but they lost, and I don't even have to look this up, I feel confident saying this, they lost more games this season alone than probably their entire college career added up. Absolutely. I would say. Yeah. In terms of what McKinney did in Alabama and what Thomas experienced at Georgia. So, you know, those guys... Just think about the rude awakening that they experience when they first arrive because they've been here a few seasons. And yeah. then you bring in some of these other young players. You know, Deontay Banks came from Maryland. Maryland, not as big of a powerhouse sure. as some of the other programs. But I think your point is well taken. When you look at the caliber of the programs that these players have come from, they've experienced losing at a level that they probably have never experienced if you combine peewee football, (laughs) high school football, and college football up, I would say they may have more losses in two or three seasons with the Giants than their entire lifespan combined. If that doesn't tell you at all, then I don't know what does. Lance bringing up the peewee records. That's that's the good stuff you get on Big Blue Kickoff Live We do not remove anything from the resume, (laughs) Madeline. Okay, the minute they came out of the womb when they held the football, we're Uh here to analyze that too. Exactly, exactly. We're the measurables. Um, Giants fans, take your fandom to the next level with a season ticket membership stay connected to the club all year round not just on game days memberships are now available for the 2024 season to learn more about all the exclusive member benefits visit giants.com slash tickets limited inventory is available 201-939-4513 is the phone number as we go back to the phone lines pete in north carolina is on the line pete you're on with lance and madeline how's it going Pete? Hey guys, how, yes. how about how about them Giants beating the Eagles? Come on now. <laughs> how about them Giants, right? It's a, it feels good to go uh, into the off season with that, right? You know, believe it or not, they've Listen. beaten the Eagles three of the last four times at MetLife Stadium. At I think Met that Life. gets it's overlooked just, it does. because of the dominance in Philly. It's just yeah. in Philly, Listen. yeah, yeah. Nothing makes me more happy than watching Fletcher Cox cry and say we got beat by a really bad team, knowing, <gasps> knowing. Just knowing that we just we own them, we own them. I love it. I'm so happy. What, Fletcher I was know crying. Was I didn't even see that. He oh, didn't even play yesterday. No. Yeah, yeah. Not not tears, but oh, okay. you know when they interviewed him. He oh, just, okay. Yeah, he was. 
moaning, I'll say. Okay, <laughs> yeah. He was, he was not happy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, one quick comment and then a question. The, the, the one comment is you guys have just done an amazing job all year. You make it as a Giants fan. Just so great to get all the information, Lance with the stats. You guys just have such great conversation and depth and getting exposure to the whole team and really understanding. You guys are so underrated. It's such a great gift to anybody who's a Giant fan to watch your network. So thank you so much for that. Thanks, well, thanks so much for, for saying in. that, Pete. Yeah. That means a lot. Yeah, and the quick question, like, I know, you know, who cares about the draft position? I understand as a Giants fan, you want the Eagles to lose. You always want to beat everybody, that's for sure. But when I watched that last game and I was watching Barkley towards the end, being a huge Barkley fan, just hoping that he gets, you know, 100 yards, hoping that he gets more than two touchdowns. But then getting just like, at towards the end, I just wondered, did he do enough to actually – make a statement to, you know, to help him in his renegotiation. So my question, and I'll take it off the air, is like, do you guys think Barkley, whether it was just last game or the whole year, does he, did he do enough to, to, you know, put himself in a position to be re-signed? Because I certainly hope he did. All right. Thanks for the call, Pete. Well, I mean, I think it's a fair question. I will say this. I, I don't think that any front office executive waits till week 18 to make a judgment about a player. So I don't think the short end of the response is, I don't think anybody's performance from yesterday is going to shift how the front office or the coaching staff feels about a player, Barkley included. All you have to do is, Madeline, you go back to his bi-week press conference when Joe Shane spoke to the media. Well, actually, this was before. No, well, he did. He addressed why they didn't move him at the trade deadline. So this is what I'm getting at. And the rationale behind it was because he had mentioned that, you know, there were some teams that may have shown some interest. They weren't interested in moving him because he's the best offensive weapon on the team. Yeah. So I think that's all you need to know. And I don't think anything that happened since that bye week presser has changed right. because nobody else has emerged or come out of the woodworks other than, you know, Darius Slayton's had a nice stretch. But I think Saquon established himself as the best offensive weapon. It's a question of, can now you work it out from a financial perspective? Well, and that's what it comes down to. And that is exactly it. And that's the hard part, too, because there's only so much salary cap to go around. We don't yet have the salary cap number for 2024, so it remains to be seen how much cap space the Giants will have. But again, you know, it's an unfortunate element that we've seen this happen. It's cyclical. You remember years ago, it was the tight end position that was, you know, not getting paid highly. Now the tight ends are cashing in a little bit more. The running back's position is saying, hey, don't pay a running back. Uh, that's just the narrative across the league, which is a tough narrative to have, especially when you're a player with so much talent like Saquon Barkley. But when you look at the free agent running backs this season, you've got Saquon, you've got Josh Jacobs, you've got DeAndre Swift, you've got Tony Pollard, you've got Derrick Henry, to name a few. Um, So I think the competition, too, in that free agent market for that position is going to make it challenging because not a lot of teams are looking at the running back position saying, yes, this is a position that I want to put in a large percentage of my salary cap towards because of the proclivity of injury just based on the position, not the player alone, but the position as a whole. So when you've got that combined with the amount of other players that will be in that free agent market as well, um, it kind of makes it challenging to see how that's going to pan out for you know, whether or not if, if the Giants don't franchise tag him, which is still within their ability to do, yep. um, is Saquon going to be able to find what he wants elsewhere in this market? I would love I would love it if the Giants or, you know, Saquon were able to find exactly what he was looking for. But when you take a step back and see the forest from the trees and look at the league as a whole and the value on that position, it's just a hard uh, negotiation from, from either side. But, you know, as as Pete said... The way that he played as a as a member of this Giants team, as a member of this Giants offense, I think absolutely you notice a difference when he is and is not on the field. Yeah, and it's also a difference when he scores a touchdown versus when he doesn't because they ha- had him get into the end zone multiple times, four different times. They won all four games this season. So I think that says a lot about where the offense goes when Barkley is able to get the touches either in the red zone or get some explosive plays, which he did on Sunday. Keep in mind, Josh Jacobs, Tony Pollard are also eligible to receive the franchise tags, too. So there's no guarantee that any of those guys that you mentioned actually hit the free agent market. Well, and you've got, you know, Austin Eckler, Devin Singletary, Zach Moss, A.J. Dillon, Antonio Gibson, a lot of uh, running backs that could potentially hit the free agent market is all I'm saying. Yeah, and those guys, though, I wouldn't even put in the same class as the Saquon Barkleys or the Jacobs, just in terms of the versatility that they bring to the table. But remember, all it takes is one team 
Right. He hits the market. All it takes is one team to say, Barkley's a weapon. We're willing to offer him this. But I do think the market overall has perhaps provided a wake-up call for the running backs. I mean, the guy that comes to mind to me is Miles Sanders last season. Sure. With the Eagles left, he signed with the Panthers, and he only got about $6 million per year, which is not a very high number in comparison to other spots. And we know what the franchise tag number was, right around $10 million. We don't know what those numbers are going to be. I highly doubt it's drastically going to go up because it's based on the average of the top five salaries at that position. So. To me, it's not a talent question with Saquon or what he means to the offense. It's a no, money it's math. question. Yeah, it's a That's math what it comes question. down to. And Joe Shane at his presser was specifically asked about, is the tag still on the table? Because Xavier McKinney is right. another guy yes. who could be given the tag. And Joe said he doesn't want to make it a regular theme that every offseason he utilizes the tag. But sometimes you're forced to do that sure. if you can't hammer out a long-term deal. And if the option is lose the guy and negotiate against everybody else or retain him and buy yourself some more time, you're going to use the franchise tag well, and because it's, also, it's a valuable commodity. There. And it's also tough, too, when you're negotiating with multiple valuable players at the same time. Like we saw yeah. last season, the Giants were negotiating with Saquon and Daniel Jones at the same time, and it was like, okay, what deal's going to happen? At the 11th hour, the Daniel Jones get, deal gets done, and then Saquon Barkley gets the franchise tag. Uh, and so it's a, it remains to be seen whether or not they will use it. Um, you know, people talk about, oh, if he gets franchise tagged, he could hold out. That is within his ability. You know, there's fines and and whatnot involved in that as well. But, you know, you look at what happened with Josh Jacobs. He held out. He was able to get a deal that was, you know, comparable to what Saquon got here with the Giants. But because he held out, because he wasn't at training camp, you know, he wasn't in football shape and, and was injured early on in the season. And I think that's something that has to come into consideration as well. If you're not participating with the team and not working out with the team it's like you know I could go to the gym by myself and do a little bit of this and that and I'm like okay I feel like I got a workout but if I've got you know the trainer yelling at me and saying hey this is what you got to do it's going to push me a little bit harder and so I think to be in football shape you have to be around the football team which is another risk that comes into play. Well, you got to be able to put the pads on and right. embrace or try to simulate that physicality, which doesn't happen when you're not on the field. Both of these players that we're talking about followed similar paths. Jacobs, though, didn't join the team until right before the regular season. Saquon got it done right as training camp started, which was great. But no running back is going to sit out an entire season if they're tagged. Because we went through that with Le'Veon Bell, and nobody has duplicated his game plan. There's a reason, because nobody is willing, based on the running back market, to take $10 million and throw it to the wayside when they know they'll never make it back. So a player can say that, but it never is going to come to fruition. So that, to me, if I'm a front office executive, I'm not just talking about Joe Shane, any team, I'm not shying away from tagging a running back because I'm worried about them holding out. You do have to weigh the football versus regular shape discussion there's no doubt about it but even Saquon coming back and joining the team at the start of training camp he still wound up dealing with an injury right so there's no bulletproof version that can be created where whether a guy is with you during all of camp or joins you right before week one that he's automatically going to stay healthy regardless of the circumstances exactly exactly 201-939-4513 is the phone number as we go back to the phone lines rob in yonkers is calling in to Big Blue Kickoff Live. Rob, you're on the line with Lance and Madeline. How's it going? How you doing, guys? I'm doing good. Happy Happy Victory Monday. Happy Victory Monday, indeed. They got a solid spread of cookies out there in the cafeteria to celebrate, I will say. Well, you got a glance. Yeah, I have not seen them uh-huh, yet, so uh-huh. now you have in, me at my edge of my seat here. Exactly. In terms of what I'll see later. There's some yes. variety out there. What's okay. going on, Rob? <laughs> um, number one, I'm, I'm happy we beat the Eagles. It's about time. Uh, just a, just a few things. I hope I hope Shepard stays in the organization as far as a worker because he's a giant for life. Um, and I hope McKinley, um, O'Kara, and Barkley also also stay on the team. Um, so I have um, one question and a quick story. The, the first question is: um, Where do we finish in the uh, as far as the defensive takeaways this season? I, I, were we up at least the top ten or somewhere? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'll look it up. They had 31 takeaways on the season. They have not had 30 takeaways, at least 30 in a season, since 2012 when Perry Fuel was the defensive coordinator to Tom Coughlin. So, and it's even he went more over a decade. 
in that span. And it's even more impressive, too, because as we mentioned, it took them a while to get that going. The first four games of the season, they didn't. So they had 31 takeaways in just 13 games. Yeah, when they were quiet. And I'm looking it up right now because I was waiting for the remainder of the season to pan out. We still had a few games. They finished tied with the Ravens for the lead with 31 takeaways this season. Only three teams had at least 30. Baltimore, New York at 31. Buffalo at 30. And that's why it's kind of crazy when you think about it. The Giants tied for first in takeaways. They had a plus 12 turnover differential, which also put them amongst the top teams in the NFL, tied with Baltimore. Yet the Ravens finish with the best record in the AFC, and the Giants have the sixth overall pick in the NFL draft. And my main differential right off the top without looking at any numbers, look at what Baltimore's offense put up. Look at what the Giants' offense put up. That's all you need to know. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah, that, 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 that's actually pretty good for us, especially at the beginning of the season. We had no takeaways. But I have to catch up to them by the end of the season. That was actually pretty, pretty good. Sure. Unfortunately, um, though, it's a result-oriented business, and I'm sure you'd like to see that be tied to success as opposed to just winning a participation trophy, as I like to call it. But as we saw last yeah. season, too, the Giants won a lot of those close games last year, and this year, you know, they yeah. struggle with a lot and of that's those. that's the those fine pendulum. line of winning yeah. and losing football games. Pendulum sure. swings both ways. Yeah. And, uh, and my quick story, um, when I was six months old, I fell off the bed, and, my, and I was crying, and my, and my big brother didn't know how to stop me from crying. So he actually brought me downstairs. At that time, there was a Giants game on. He goes, I put you in front of the Giants TV, and you stop crying. He goes, every, day, he goes, every game after that, you basically you, I kept you in front of the TV, and you kept calm when I was babysitting you. And the reason why I say that is because he passed away two years ago. Oh, and yes, sorry to hear that. Yesterday, thank you. Yesterday was his birthday. What was so his every name? Time I, um, Tyrone Santos. All right. Um, and every time I watch football, I watch the Giants, I have a picture of him watching the TV, watching the TV with me. And yesterday, again, yesterday was his birthday and they actually won. So it was like, it was like a special moment for, for me and him, even though he's not here. I was like, I was like, I guess today was your birthday. So I guess you actually helped him out. I love that. I nice. love that the Giants got the win on Tyrone's birthday and that the Giants did not cause you to cry yesterday uh, with yeah, that win yeah. over the Eagles, <laughs> Rob. That's just a very sweet story. Thank you for sharing. All right, guys, thank you so much. Um, you guys are great. You guys actually keep me informed with everything. Even if I miss sometimes, I, I, I always catch up. But I want to say thank you, and I'll keep listening to you guys. And I'm all from here. Thank you, guys. Have a good week. Have a good day. You Thanks as well, for Rob. the call, Rob. Appreciate it. That's very That's sweet. That's some tie-in, yeah. Football is family indeed. Well, I mean, it just goes to show you, and I'm sure you could hear a lot of similar stories from Giants fans who have been supporting this organization and team for many, many years. You know, it's passed down from generation to generation, just like he was just talking about. His brother was a Giants fan. He puts him in front of the television. See, I thought Paul Dettino was going to be tied into that story somehow, <laughs> you know, given how long maybe he was associated that, you know, Paul Dettino popped up on a show or something like that, but he went in a different area with that. And, you know, it, it's a family bonding experience, as you mentioned, Madeline. I, I think that story spells it all out. Absolutely. You gotta, gotta love those stories that just kind of ignite the joy and all that kind of stuff. And so, and great to get a win as the season concludes as well. I like the fact that, too, that he mentioned Sterling Shepard. What a great send off that he had yesterday. He got those three catches. And then, you know, it was funny because that third catch after it was in the backfield, and it was initially. officially ruled yeah. as a run. And so they got him back on the field to make sure that he got that third catch, moved to number five all time in the Giants receptions list. Um, it, it just shows what an impact Sterling Shepard has had on this organization as a human. You know, people, fans might point to, oh yeah, well he's got a lot of injuries and this and that. This man is a consummate teammate, a consummate professional. You saw last year when he was out hurt, he had custom made t-shirts, gas up every one of his teammates. And the fact that the organization made it a priority to give him that on what he said, what Sterling Shepard said, could have been his last game, not just as a Giant, but in the NFL. That remains to be seen if that will be the case. But, um, you know, that, what a really wonderful send-off to somebody who has meant so much to this organization on and off the football field. I think the most telling statement yesterday was, if you listen to what Wanda Robinson had to say about the impact Sterling Shepard has had on his development and his career. And then it was interesting because Sterling was thinking back to when he first came in mm -hmm. and you had the Victor Cruz's of the world, yeah. the Odell Beckham's of the world, and how they served as mentors for him and Sterling pass the baton on to some of these other younger guys. I think that, to me, is more telling than any other statistic that you could bring into the mix. As far as his future is concerned, you know, coaching was dangled out there. 
as well, well and, as perhaps continuing to play. But once again, he's going to have to speak to his family and see what he wants to do here moving forward. Well, and he's told me many times that he wants to get into broadcasting. So who knows? Maybe we'll get him in the BBK rotation next year. <laughs> Can you imagine? We'll see. We'll run that by Schmelk and see what he thinks. Sterling Shepard on the BBK desk? No? Yeah? He's getting a thumbs up. Thumbs up. So, Shep, listen. For you or for him? Which one? No. As a, as a, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> she's the one that brought it up. So, you know. <laughs> listen. I'm over here playing for draft picks. Draft yeah. my replacement. <laughs> <laughs> what, but, you know, whatever he does next, whether or not this is the end of his football career, I'm sure that uh, he will find success. And I hope that he does. And, and you know, you got to love to Victor Cruz on our post game show on MSG Networks yesterday was talking about how, you know, he remembers being in a very similar position as Shep was, you know, at the end of his career, just kind of knowing that this is it. This is hanging it and up. Also and also dealing with injuries, too. And dealing with injuries yeah. and, and being have to, having to fight back from those injuries to get back on the field and the exhausting mental and physical drain that that takes. And, you know, he said he talked to Shep before the game. He said, hey, man, just, just take it in and, and try to remember it all for what it is. And the fact that, you know, they announced him as he got to run on the field last uh, as the offense and all that kind of stuff. It was just a, a really nice, and as Shep called it, an emotional last game of the season. Well, because I think it all started to sink in, especially when his teammates were yeah. pulling for him to get back out on the field. They got that late takeaway I know. to give the offense an opportunity to get back on the field. I'm sure he was feeling it yeah. at that point. But I felt bad, too. They tried to get him that touchdown, and James Bradbury was like, no, 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 James Bradbury bats yeah. the ball away. Reed Blankenship intercepts it. It's like, oh. Could have been. James is not here for sentimental moments. No. So, hey, listen, you got to respect the competitor and all these guys, right? You know, got to. if Sterling wants the touchdown, he's going to have to earn it. And exactly. even his former teammate will tell him mm -hmm. that right to his face. Exactly. But they at least they were trying. There was even that play when Sterling was running, literally, he was next to Tyrod Taylor. Yeah. And it, he didn't even realize Tyrod was that close to him. If you go back and you watch the play, and I'm sure Tyrod was like, Sterling, what are you trying to hug me here? Or are you going to try like, to run into the end zone? Come on. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, he was trying. It was the fun. effort was there. The effort was there, but you know what? It got it done. Number five overall in the all-time list. You know what I think was interesting, too, is we called up that list. The fact that Tiki Barber, a running back, is number two just kind of shows uh, how, I don't know, it's just... What dual threat. Like, dual threat, yeah. yeah. Well, that's why we talk about Saquon in the exactly. same way, right? Exactly. Weapon. Not a running back, a weapon. Weapon. A football player. 201-939-4513 is the phone number as we go back to the phone lines. Jerome in Charlotte, patiently holding Jerome. You're on the line with Lance and Madeline. How's it going? It's going good. Proud to be a giant. Um, yesterday was a class act with uh, Sterling. Um, you know, a lot of organizations wouldn't have done that, but I'm glad the Giants did. But going forward, um, I believe, I just read um, they let t man go. They're going to try to keep the other coordinators. Yeah, the expectation I, is that Mike Kafka and Wink Martindale will return. That's yeah, what Brian Dable, Dable said. Dable said the expectation is they'll return. He said that he hasn't had individual conversations with them yet about the future, but he does expect that they will be back. I've been watching for, uh, yes, I've been watching for Giant fans for over uh, 45 years now. And I, I love the team. I love every player that wears the uniform. But right now, going forward, I believe that we do we do not have the quarterback on our roster going forward. Um, I understand they're going to Jones got a big contract. You know, whenever he's healthy, he's going to play. But I've been watching um, Young Love with Green Bay and some of these other first year. Opportunity. Well, Jerome, let me just jump in here. I don't think Jordan Love is a good example. Yeah, Jordan Love, okay, he guy. was drafted several years ago. He sat behind Aaron Rodgers. He got one spot start when Aaron had COVID, and now he got his first opportunity. So you could argue Jordan Love benefited from seasoning. That was the Aaron Rodgers approach. Remember, Aaron sat behind Brett Favre for three years. Drew Pat Brees Patrick was Mahomes there. Sat, well, you know. well, Patrick sat behind Alex Smith for one year, and then Philip Rivers sat behind Drew Brees for two years. So, you know, a lot of those rookies, they panned out, but in today's NFL, you don't see that happening because if you draft a guy that high, there's the instantaneous gratification philosophy. We got to get him out there sooner rather than later because the clock is ticking on the rookie deal. So I don't think Jordan Love is a very good example. They took patience. That was their approach with him before he even got out on the field. Well, that's 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 what I'm leading to is that we um, whatever I uh, I think we they say we was maybe six yeah we six can pick. still get a quarterback and you know and keep him groom him have time to groom him 
but we need to get a high caliber quarterback because I watch um, as the offense open up for Taylor and he's slinging it downfield. But we have, you know, I looked at um, Jones' um, record. He only, out of the time he'd been with us, he only threw nine times over 300 yards. And, you know, that don't always get it. He's more of a threat for his... Well, believe it or not, you know, Tyrod Taylor had his first career 300-yard game a few games back. So, I mean, it's even been rare in his career, and he's been with a few different organizations. And he almost made it three in a row last night. He had 297. If not for that thumb injury... took the yardage back, If not for that thumb injury, he probably would have gotten it. He very well could have. Listen, Jerome, I don't disagree with your point. I understand your logic. You have a high pick. Maybe you draft a quarterback... Joe Shane, remember, they have to address the quarterback position one way or the other, whether it's through free agency, through the draft, because Tommy DeVito is the only other healthy quarterback under contract. Joe Shane mentioned today that they have to prepare for the worst case scenario that Daniel Jones may not be ready to go week one. So that position is going to be addressed. He also would not rule out bringing back Tyrod Taylor. Right. Everything is on the table as it stands right now. Could they utilize the pick to draft a quarterback? Absolutely. I don't think you can rule anything out, but they have emphasized that Daniel, in their eyes, is still the guy. And if he's healthy, he's going to have the opportunity to get out on the field. So if you want to use a high pick on a quarterback and you're okay with you groom them, he serves as a depth guy, that could very well fit into the Giants' equation, but I'd be very surprised if they draft a guy and if Daniel eventually gets to full health, especially by the start of the season, that Daniel now is going to be the spectator and the other guy is going to move past him. That's well, and, all I'm and saying. And especially, too, when you consider the fact that if Daniel Jones is not ready to play week one, Joe Shane has said, hey, it's a priority that we find a guy who can go out there and win us some games. And yeah. so uh, if you're drafting a guy in the top 10, top six, number six overall, you're expecting this person to be able to make an immediate impact on the franchise right but it's also you're not doing that as a plug and play quarterback to play a couple games until Daniel Jones is healthy so it remains to be seen what their strategy will be what their approach will be I would be surprised if they use that early pick on a quarterback I uh, personally uh I think but you know they've got a lot of options whether it be in free agency or what have you to get a solid backup quarterback because as we've seen especially in recent years last the 2022 season was a, a, a like highlight story of how important a backup quarterback is in the league, right? Or, you know, even for the Giants, you know, when you see a quarterback go down and you've got, you don't have a solid backup quarterback, the drop-off there is significant. So whoever it is, is I don't think the Giants are looking to bring in somebody to compete with Daniel Jones for the starting job, but to be somebody who they know they can trust to hold the ship afloat while you know, while Daniel Jones works his way back to health. Well, 11 of the 16 teams this season in the AFC had to go to a backup or even further. So, I mean, that tells you the movement. I think you're probably looking, I mean, what you spelled out is Arizona, to me, is an interesting team to put under the microscope here because Kyler Murray suffered a knee injury later in the year than Daniel Jones. So Daniel's ahead of him in terms of the recovery process. And what did the Cardinals do? They went out and they acquired Joshua Dobbs before they traded him to the Vikings. So they went the route of, let me bring in a journeyman veteran quarterback who could fill in. And Dobbs, look at what he did against the Giants. And they also beat the Cowboys earlier this season. The Giants could elect to go that route if Mm -hmm. Daniel's not ready to go. Or they could go the route of the draft. And they believe that the guy they take, Madeline, is ready to get on the field automatically to maybe build the bridge initially and then learn and be a sponge in the quarterback room. I could see a lot of different scenarios that the Giants could follow. I don't think there's one rule of thumb that they have to definitely adopt. Well, here's what I'm thinking. Not only what you just said, but what I'm, they have the fifth-year option on them, and so they won't have to rush Jones back also. They can let Jones take his time, make sure he's healed. Well, the fifth-year and- option on who? Who are we talking about the fifth-year option? I'm confused. If we get one in the first round. We yeah, have but, to, but the uh, fifth year option, yeah. hold on, Jerome, you're really getting ahead of yourself. Okay, hold on. Let's do some basic math here. You draft a quarterback in 2024, he gets four years on the rookie contract, and then the fifth year option. You're worried about his fifth year option, which is going to be no, five years down we, the road we, to exercise? What are we talking about here? We, we, we have plenty of time to groom him if he, you know, to make sure he's ready. When Jones' contract is up in what? Another two, three years, you know, he is ready. 
to step in and well, you'll have the, the flexibility. Yes, meaning he's going right, to be under contract. I okay, though, I get that. I think that Jerome, you're looking at this as a certainty that after Daniel Jones's contract is up, that he's no longer the quarterback, which I think would be a surprise. I don't think the Giants signed Daniel Jones to this extension, thinking, okay, we'll pay you for this, and then you're done here. I think they look at him as their quarterback as it stands right now. So if you draft a quarterback in the first round with as you're describing and say, okay, great, we'll rest him behind, or you know, he'll learn behind Daniel Jones while he sees out this contract, and then we'll go to this guy. I I, I, I don't necessarily know that the Giants are going to use that real estate, a number six overall pick for that, when you can also find some talented quarterbacks later on in the draft, perhaps in the second, third round, what have you, um, if it's not somebody who you look to make an immediate impact. And when you look at the needs of this team, the offensive line, perhaps, or, or, or something like that. If you want to get like a valuable, you've got Evan Neal dealing with injuries, and you saw what happened when that tackle position, uh, you needed a, a replacement there in the drop-off there. You need to have a solid backup tackle. That could be a, a, per, a chance of that number six overall spot instead of somebody who you're going to kind of put on the shelf for a few years using that real estate because hopefully, hopefully the Giants are not going to be continuing to be at this point of the draft for many more years. So when you have a pick like that, you want to use it as somebody who can make an impact. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, Jerome, and we appreciate the phone call. Jerome's working on the exit strategy yeah. before, you know, the actual strategy is implemented. He's already retiring Daniel, Daniel Jones. Jones. He's yeah. thinking about 2029. Correct, exactly. yeah. I mean, that's why I, I understood where he started to come around at the end saying that you can afford to sit a quarterback because you have the fifth-year option. I you get can, that logic, yes. but that's assuming that you're ready to transition to that guy. Exactly. Maybe you're not ready to transition because Daniel Jones stays healthy and is productive and you stick it out with the veteran so that's why i thought he was getting ahead of himself right and if you have like a more veteran quarterback that makes more sense right that makes more sense if you're saying okay this quarterback right now on this deal like if you've got aaron Rodgers as your quarterback that makes more sense because you know that this is probably his last contract right we're not expecting him to continue to play for much longer if he does Whereas Daniel Jones, this is not something that you would look at and say, oh, I expect this to be his last contract in the league. And I think without that expectation, it seems frivolous to say, oh, well, let's draft his replacement at number six overall for two, three years from now. Sure. I mean, listen, all logical conclusions. I just I look at it through the lens of you're not drafting just for 2023. Sure. Your point about high valuable real estate no disagreement but the sixth overall pick who do you see as a guy that is going to contribute for years to come for years and to come and if, immediately though immediately too no you definitely want immediacy but you also want to make sure that that's somebody that's valuable enough that is not just going to be a flash for year one exactly. and then fall down but somebody that will provide a consistent option and you know what we were just talking about with the nfl landscape with so many teams going to back up quarterbacks, I think teams are starting to say to themselves, we need to feel good about two quarterbacks on our roster. And mm -hmm. with Daniel, while he's still young and there's a lot of upside, he's only stayed healthy for one season. Exactly. So you just you wonder how does that shape the conversation, Madeline? Not just about Daniel coming off the rehab, but Daniel even in 2025 and 2026, can he hold up? I think all fair questions and things that the Giants front office at least has to discuss. And this is not saying that they're doubting him. It's just you have to prepare. I thought the way Joe Shane worded it today, you always have to prepare for the worst case scenario. That's what right. he specifically laid out, which means they're not going in to this offseason saying Daniel's going to be ready week one. He's going to play all 17 games. There's not going to be any concerns or any questions. They're hoping for that to come to fruition, but they're going to prepare accordingly. And by the time we get to the draft, Madeline, mm -hmm. you're going to have had free agency pass. So if they want to explore a veteran, that ship will have sailed. And you'll have a better read on Daniel Jones's rehab by the time we get to late April. So the intel that you'll be collecting is a lot more attractive and better than the two of us having this conversation in the early stages of January. Totally. And that's important to take into totally. consideration. And one other thing that's important to consider, especially when it com comes to Daniel Jones's health, is the protection that he has received, right? The Giants have yeah. just parted ways with their offensive line coach because the team allowed the second most sacks in a season in NFL history. You know, you think about Andrew Luck, the quarterback for the Colts who had so much talent but retired prematurely because he was sure. hit so many times. Andrew Luck played 86 games in his career. 
He was sacked 174 times in 86 games. And that amount of physicality was enough for him to say, you know what, I need to retire early from this game. Daniel Jones has played 60 career games. So that's 26 fewer games than Andrew Luck played in his career. He has been sacked 179 times, which is five times more than Andrew Luck was sacked in his career. And that just shows the amount of of hits that Daniel Jones has taken of course he suffered some bumps and bruises along the way, right? Sure. So I think as much as you want to look at the quarterback position and say, yes, well, this guy hasn't stayed healthy, this, that, you need to also address the team around him to put him in a position to be able to stay on the field. Oh, all valid points, and that's why you have to take that into consideration. You got to take Evan Neal's injury history into consideration right. because you got to protect that position as much as you have to protect the quarterback. Exactly. So, you know, all of these things... They're interwoven with one another. That's why you don't consider A without at least looking at B and C. And if you go in the direction of A, how does that hurt you or help you yeah. in the department of B or C? The only thing I will say is, remember, Andrew Luck had the ship to orchestrate, okay? The Captain Luck on his Twitter handle. So he had a backup job. I don't know if That's Daniel true. has That's something true. else lined you know, up. I don't you know, know. It's a little bit different know. in Dearest terms mother. of you know, other job security <laughs> and options, Madeline. We yeah. can't overlook... The key elements in this conversation. That's true. That's okay? true. You know, he had let's to not go, drop the ball. He here. had to go pen some yeah. letters to his mother from the there battlefield, Captain See? Andrew. Luck. So he had some other priorities outside of football, is what I'm saying. Valid you know, point here, Lance. I don't know if Daniel's been fitted for a specific ship. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, the yeah. USS, whatever. I, I don't know. I don't know if he's in the admiral territory, captain territory. I don't know if he's going to be chasing Captain Hook. You know, <laughs> I, I can't answer a lot of these questions here, Madeline. Who knows? So, we've, got, we've got questions indeed. And you, you mentioned Evan Neal and his injury history as well. And I think that's got to be an interesting thing to point out is the fact that at Alabama, the, the durability was a point of emphasis for him. He was somebody who was on the field and available and yeah. not used to dealing with injury. And now his first two years as a pro, not only is he dealing with injury, he's also headed to foot surgery right now. And that is a, a, an obstacle, a new obstacle. You know, some players who have dealt with injury and have navigated that, that's one thing. But a player who's used to being healthy and available and is like, no, I'm not hurt. I can play through this and pushing himself in a way that he isn't used to because he's not used to playing hurt. He's not used to being this hurt. That's something that the young guy is learning. And Andrew Thomas said, too, you know, he's taken it upon himself to say, hey, like, let me keep him focused and positive because this guy has a lot of talent. He just needs to take care, get his body tuned up and be right and be healthy for 2024. Well, Madeline, Evan Neal has missed 14 games over right. two seasons, right? Eligible to play 34, 17 apiece. Mm-hmm. And he's only been out there for 20. So he is just barely over one full season, but he's been in the league for two years. And he was a high pick. You got to keep these guys on the field. Right. You know, it eats into their potential and their value. So the offensive line and the quarterback, if you were to ask me right now, the two biggest priorities before we see whatever happens at free agency, you know, that's the top of the list. Not to say that the incumbents should not be in the equation. It's just you've got to protect yourself in both of those departments. Depth is key. Giants fans, the Giants official connected TV streaming app Giants TV brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to big blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV and on the Giants mobile app. 201-939-4513 is the phone number as we go to our final caller of the afternoon today, Scott in New Mexico. Scott, you're on Big Blue Kickoff Live with Lance and Madeline. Hi, Madeline. Hi, Lance. How are you doing today? Doing all right, Scott. Scott. What's going? on your mind? Uh, I'll make this brief since I know you're short on time. Uh, I think they have the backup quarterback they need on the team, and I hope they do everything they can to resign Tyron Taylor. Because not only can he lead a team, but as a backup, he'd be great uh, while Daniel Jones recuperates. So I hope they make every effort to get him uh, uh, resigned. That being said, I want to ask you a question that necessarily you may not be able to answer. Uh, if the, we know that injuries are the great equalizer in the National Football League. It's addressed in every single team. You saw what happened to Miami, losing both of their defensive linemen and losing Waddle and so forth. It happens Raheem to every Mostert, single yep. team. Right. Uh, here's a hypothetical question. It's actually two. If the Giants were healthier... Uh, in other words, they didn't have or sustain as many injuries as they had. Would they be a different team, or are there still pieces missing that the Giants would have to address? Uh, because they only scored offensively only 25 touchdowns in the entire year. 
That is an interesting question, Scott, because I think, you know, it's hard to, yeah, go ahead. And then the second part of it, although, uh, as you addressed earlier, uh, both the coordinators uh, are intending to stay, what if they decide to both leave? I'm not saying they're going to. I'm just saying, if again, a hypothetical, they both leave. Does that put the Giants back? In other words, because in the development process, you're still going to have to have two replacements with a different set of uh, parameters than the two uh, coordinators have. So two questions again. If the team was healthier, would they have a different record? Or, again, pieces missing? And if both coordinators left, would that put the Giants back? And I'll take your answers off here, guys. Thanks right. again. Thanks so All much right. for the yeah, call, appreciate Scott. The call. Appreciate it. I mean, that's a hard. those are both hard questions to a- answer because they're both very hypothetical. And if ifs and buts were candy and nuts, every day would be Christmas, <laughs> as Imani Tumor always says. Um, but if the team were healthier, I think absolutely it would have been a different season, right? I think, you know, week one, Andrew Thomas dealing with that hamstring injury, that made a, an impact right there. You, you, the amount of injuries, the offensive line, we've talked about this ad nauseum. That right there makes an impact. I think if it's health, if if the group as a whole is healthier, they can build together week in and week out, rather than having to kind of continually, okay, new person, new this, new that, and, and kind of figure it out with the moving parts, right, Lance? Well, I think the injuries took a toll on this team. There's no doubt about it. But I've said this multiple times, Madeline. Whether Daniel Jones was under center, whether Tyrod Taylor was under center, whether Tommy DeVito was under center, this team struggled to score. Now, did they have all their weapons at their disposal? No. There were stretches where Darren Waller didn't play, where Saquon didn't play. But we're now here at the tail end of the season, and the scoring has gone up a little bit. Okay, mm-hmm. I'll give them credit. But, you know, the explosive plays have been hit or miss. Finishing drives have been hit or miss. It's a hypothetical world. I don't think it's automatic to say if they had everybody healthy for all 17 games that, Madeline, I'm taking a six-win team and I'm giving them 10 wins. And we're talking no. about, you know, they're getting in as a wild card spot. But also, Could they but have also, won another game or two? Perhaps. Could the offensive numbers, instead of averaging about 15 a game, could you have been in 17, 18-point territory? Perhaps. I think, though, if you look at the team as constructed, as was out there, they were a play away from being a 9 or 10 win team. I mean, the Rams game right there, a missed field goal away, the the Jets game, the the Bills game, right? So it's like that is as constructed. There's three potential almost could have won right there, too. And I'm not saying this team would have gone to the Super Bowl and, you know, and I would have gotten a Giants tattoo over it. (laughs) I'm saying that this would have been a different team had they not dealt with so much injuries. Well, and there's no doubt about that the injuries took a toll once again. But the reason I don't like to play the coulda, woulda, shoulda game with scores, then you could do the opposite. Right. You could go to games they won that they could have lost. Right. Had right? had Jason Pinnock not been hurt and Dane Belton not been in there, he wouldn't have had the takeaways that Dane Belton had. Uh, possible. And that would have been, a, and not saying that Jason Pinnock couldn't have done that, but that positive play from Dane Belton wouldn't have been on the field. Sure. Or so it could go both ways. Yeah, I mean, the Arizona game. You know, what happens if they don't get Daniel Jones to Jalen Hyatt at the beginning of the second half? You take away a touchdown. I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm coming up. You could come up with a hypothetical. The Patriots game. Chad Ryland misses a field goal at the last second. He makes that. They go to overtime. I don't know how that game is going to pan out. So I say things cancel each other out, Madeline, over the course of the season as a product of close games, Mm. as a product of injuries. So are we talking about maybe a game differential here or there? Perhaps. I don't know if it would have been a drastic difference is all I'm saying. Now, the other question which I lost because I've been which, so enthralled in the this other hypothetical. Question, the other question that Scott asked was that if hypothetically, if there is a situation in which both the offensive and defensive That's coordinators right. do That's not come back, which Scott, I, l- I really appreciate how the season's been over for one day and he's already thinking, all right, what's the worst case scenario? Well, how we've been we... using that term a lot on this show, so, so I guess it fits into the theme. It's fair. So, I, I, you know, that's a tough one because, again, as Brian Dable said this morning at their media availability, that he does expect both Wink and Kafka to be back. He also said that he hasn't had those conversations with them yet. Um, but anytime you lose a coordinator, offensive, defensive, otherwise, that changes things. And, you know, as a team, as a player, as a unit – the head coach changing is one thing, but a coordinator changing is another. I mean, you saw what happened with the Eagles this year. You know, there there's some diff, distinctive shifts in the way that both the offensive and, uh, offense and defense function uh, because the coordinator is the person who's like your direct boss. It's like if at, at your day-to-day job, if you have a different direct report, even if the job itself is the same, 
Maybe the way your new boss wants you to do it is different. Maybe the way your new boss tells you what they expect of you is different. Maybe the way your new boss communicates with you is different. Even if the actual job itself is relatively the same, things are going to change when you have somebody else in your ear constantly. Well, the reason why I think and you don't even have to go through all the details that it would have an impact is because, you know, where do you go to replace those individuals? Exactly. If you go to internal promotions, you know, you look at this staff, there's not a lot of experienced play callers on the defensive and the offensive side of the ball. I will say this. If we are to go down this hypothetical road, and let me preface my comments, it's a hypothetical road, okay? Hypothetical. Hypothetical. Underlined. Not saying it's going to happen. Bold, italic, hypothetical. Yes, and this is not me saying one coordinator is more effective than the other. Also prefacing my commentary, I do think since Dable and Kafka put their offensive philosophies together... And let's say Kafka did move on for whatever the reason being. You still have Dable here. Shea Tierney is your QB coach. Maybe you do an internal promotion like we saw in Buffalo. Whereas it's Wink's defense. Right. Okay. Wink did not bring in another individual. And as a tag team, they put together the scheme. So if Wink leaves, even if you promote somebody from within, you know, they're going to put their own stamp. You bring somebody external. It is a brand new scheme. So I think losing Wink in comparison to the changes on offense would be a bit different because of the dynamics that I just laid out. Absolutely. And again, further emphasizing for those just tuning in, this is a whole hypothetical conversation per Scott's question. Uh, but that being said, we do hope that, as Dable said this morning, that the team intends to keep both coordinators, yep. offensive and defensive. And again, you know, uh, special teams coordinator Thomas McGahee no longer with the team moving forward. Offensive line coach uh, Bobby Johnson also no longer with the team moving forward. And uh, Fitz also yeah. taking his Craig challenge. Craig and, and Jeff Nixon. And, and Jeff Nixon. Uh, running backs coach Jeff Nixon will be going to the college game too. Dable said, you know, hey, I want to wish him all the success. He's going to be the offensive coordinator at Syracuse. And, you know, he's expressed his want to be a, a college head coach someday. So hopefully he's on his well on his way to do that. And real quickly before we wrap, you know, mm -hmm. Dable, the one thing that he has not done is – you have not seen him stand in the way of assistance pursuing Absolutely. other opportunities. I mean, even remember, this is going to be their third running backs coach mm -hmm. in as many seasons, which is, you know, rare if you look at the turnover rate, especially for a positional coach. But their previous coach, DeAndre Smith, you know, went to Indianapolis yep. for the same position. And they were actually they were asked about that. Well, you know, when you have a move that's identical as opposed to a promotion, don't you have the right to step in? And he said, Dable, hey, every situation is different. But he just, I think as somebody that's paid his dues, mm -hmm. he's not going to get in the way of an individual if they can use it as a stepping stone to pursue whatever they would like. And I think that's been pretty consistent. And I think, too, you want people who want to be here. You want people who want Absolutely. to be here. And you don't yeah. want, you know, I don't think you ever want to put somebody in a position saying, hey, listen, I know that this is something that you'd really like to pursue. But selfishly, I want to keep you here for my reasons. I don't think, and, and Dable, to his credit, is not that guy at all. He is absolutely saying, hey, if you want to pursue this, I fully support you. I wholeheartedly do. It's another reason why coaches should always be able to have the power to hire their own staff. Because you also want individuals under you mm -hmm. that there's a trust factor and there's a even level of excitement to be working with one another. When you force people on other individuals... It doesn't necessarily lead to positive results. And I think everybody can relate to that in some aspect and walk of life. I'm not insinuating that about anybody at this table or anyone behind the scenes to read into that. Let me leave it at that. Oh. <laughs> I, was just, I was just clarifying. That's oh, what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. Right. Well, I didn't, well, on that note, yes. I'm not, not saying No, that. well, in case you were reading into anything. Oh, I was no. saying, that's what I, I think no. you may have misinterpreted what I said. Not at yes. all. I okay. was just noticing just the clock sure. and saying, all right, well, okay. uh, we'll, we'll wrap all it up. All good. <laughs> well, all right. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Big Blue Kickoff Live brought to you by Cadillac. It's part of the Giants podcast platforms everywhere and Giants.com slash podcast. For Lance Meadow, I'm Madeline Burke. Thanks so much for listening to our show. More Big Blue Kickoff Live for the rest of this week and moving forward and whatnot. That's our show. Bye. Have a good one. <laughs>